All right, we are live. What's up, my brothers? Uh, we're at uh, Before the Trainwreck, episode number 96. And uh, switching it up tonight, talking about a specific chapter in Robert Greene's, uh, I think it's his most recent book anyway, The Law of Human Nature. And um, I picked up the summary. I, I also, like whenever I pick up a summary, I always grab the full book too, just to support the author. But um, the summary was great. And there was a piece that really stood out on the topic of envy, which I think is really, really important because... Uh, this does tie into the notion of uh, before the train wreck. Absolutely does. Um, before we get started, a little housekeeping. I had to switch up the camera angle. My hardware's off tonight for some reason, so uh, we're back on the webcam. But um, yo, it works just fine. Perfect. Um, let's do this. Going to drop the link for YouTube. Do me a solid if you're on um, Facebooks or the Twitters of the world. Just uh, click that and head over to YouTube. It helps me out a ton. Hit the like button. Um, let's get the likes up so uh, we can get this sent out to the YouTube algorithms. And uh, let's get started. So this was a chapter that I listened to that really, like it sent shivers down my spine, if I'm being honest, when I heard some of these things because they had previously eluded me and I had not noticed them. And um, they're really, really important. Um, I'm going to give you some uh, examples that I've, I've tripped across over the years that really il illustrate the importance of understanding envy, which also ties into jealousy. You guys have often heard me say that, um, you know, hate always comes from beneath you. People never get uh, jealous of a loser. Um, and jealousy and envy is pretty much tied into the same thing. It's, it's usually envy first, then friendships follow with most of these people. So, <clears throat> I'm going to define it in a set of concentric perimeters. Actually, it's really just two. Um, the people on the inside of your perimeter, so let's call it the five people that you spend the most time with, um, your closest friends, family members, uh, maybe business partners, maybe select top management that you work with, um, you know, maybe that, you know, one chick or a couple chicks if you're spinning plates or whatever that might be on the inside that are like, you know, more on the top shelf type of women tier. But the, but the people that you trust more than the people on the outside. And generally speaking, the threat comes from the inside. So you have to be really, really careful with envy because the people that are envious of you on the inside will, will aim to um, hurt you at the end of the day. And I'll, you know, I'll explain why and how in this cast. Uh, by the way, I will be taking questions you know, towards the end when I'm, when I'm done my um, presentation here on this topic. So uh, it shouldn't take many more than 20 or 30 minutes to get through it. So I know a lot of you guys are like, hey, I got a question. How do I ask? Stand by. I will I will get you on in just a moment. Um, and then on the outside of that perimeter, you got a bunch of haters as well, which will um, come at you. But they don't really matter. Um, for the most part, for most of you guys out there, they're mostly invisible. Um, you start to notice them more when you do something like I've been doing on YouTube where you know you start to build an audience. There's people that know, like, and trust you. Uh, there's people that buy from you. They're in your community. They book you for coaching. Some some of them even, you know, have become close friends of mine. I, I have a very tight net um, entrepreneur, entrepreneurs group that I actually built off um, one of my main communities a number of years ago. So, you know, these people kind of move closer to you. But the thing that you've really got to keep an eye, eye out for is the enviers in that group. The ones on the outside, again, they don't matter. These are the losers that, um, like from my scope of things, like when I see it, um, somebody will send me like an email or a DM and they're like, oh, so-and-so made a video about you and they said this, that, and the other thing and you got to respond to it. And it's like, no, I don't. I don't care. They're losers. I, it, it doesn't matter to me. I've never had anybody hit me up with one of these, oh, so-and-so did a video on you and, you know, I look at it and it's somebody that's got like a big channel. It's, it, it, it never happens. It's, it's, again, hate always comes from beneath you. Nobody ever gets jealous of losers. That's why these people are out there making these hit pieces on you um, because they want to try to bring you down to their level. You know, they want to dra drag you down to their level of mediocrity, which is which is just uh, absurd. So the best practice for um, guys out there that see that sort of stuff is really just to ignore it. You know, let them wallow in their misery and, um, you know, become your best marketers. I actually laugh sometimes because... Some of these losers end up being my best marketers because they end up having these like massive spurg out sessions 
um, and they'll go make hit pieces on me or maybe some friends of mine. And they don't realize how stupid they look because they're actually sending the people that have been on the fence about them going, I'm not sure if I really like this guy. You know, is he useful? Does he offer value? And they actually send them over to me and they become, you know, fans of, of me instead. So they're like my biggest unpaid marketing force. So let them do what they do. Again, the guys on the outside, they don't really matter. It's the ones on the inside within your inner circle that you want to keep an eye out because they will befriend you. Um, but they will befriend you because of envy first. But the problem is, is that their key goal is to find your weakness and how to hurt you. Um, they will rationalize a false narrative about your success. Like uh, you got to where you were via luck, via a silver spoon, via inheritance, something. Um, they'll always manufacture this indignation, which serves the narrative that they're trying to sell themselves and people around them. It might be a small group of uh, a gossipy group of like, you know, women or something like that, having their little clicky lunch, talking shit. It might be some guy with a little channel, you know, with a couple thousand views. And, you know, he gets it um, on with his little, you know, tiny fan base of uh, haters. But again, those people on the outside don't matter. So ones on the inside, you've got to really be very, very attentive to because they're the ones that are problematic. You need to have a neutral third party to keep an eye out over your shoulder. Um, I was at a entrepreneurs org event in Whistler, BC, like 12 years ago, I think. And Kevin O'Leary was one of the keynote speakers there. Um, uh, if you don't know who he is, he's the guy on, on, on shark tank. I, I think at the time he was, um, he was filming uh, dragons Den here in, you know, here in Toronto, which is basically, uh, you know, what launched him over to that. And one of the things that he said in his talk that, that really stuck with me over the years is in business and in life, you want a sober second thinker, somebody to keep an eye out over your shoulder to make sure that they're spotting stuff that that may not be that obvious to you. Um, in Robert Greene's part, uh, book, he calls it the neutral third party. But I like the, the way that Kevin O'Leary described it as a sober second thinker. They're going to catch you when you're about to do something stupid. They have to be somebody that you trust um, with your life. For me, it would be my brothers, right? Um, there's, there's not many people outside of that circle that I would trust to the same degree that I, you know, that I would trust my brothers. Like if they showed up, if one of them showed up at my front door at three o'clock in the morning, um, with a shovel in his hand and a body in the trunk and said, I, you know, like I need help. I need to get rid of this problem. I got his back. Right. And, you know, he would, you know, basically do the same thing for me. So you want a person on the inside to keep an eye out for problems like this. So if you're in a business transaction, if you're on a business track yet transaction, if you have a, um, um, I don't know, maybe like a woman that you're vetting for like uh, mother stock, excuse me a second. Um, you know, you plan on having kids with her or something like that. <clears throat> have a sober second thinker to just look over your shoulder and watch what they're doing. They should also be keeping an eye out for anybody that might be looking for a way to find weaknesses, try to exploit or hurt you because these envious people are dangerous. <clears throat> people will never admit to their envy because it means that they need to consider themselves inferior. I'm going to say that again. When somebody's envious of you, even if you point to, you know, to the fact that hate only ever comes from beneath you, nobody ever gets jealous of losers, they will not consider it or see it as envy because if they did, then they would recognize that they're inferior. Then it's basically an acknowledgement of their inferiority to you. <clears throat> it's it's basically the reasons why, I mean, you know, I'm just trying to think of some big channels that I, that I like to watch on YouTube. So there's some car channels, like Chris Harris is a guy that I've watched for many, many years. I wouldn't, <clears throat> I would never get a uh, video sent to me, excuse me, by one of my viewers saying, oh, you know, Chris did a video, you know, tearing you down. It doesn't, it doesn't happen, right? Again, people don't get jealous of losers. It just doesn't, it just doesn't go down that way, right? He's, he's, he's busy doing his thing. He, like guys that are expanding and putting a dent in the universe and doing big things haven't got time for envy and jealousy. That's why, you know, Green considers us people with extremely fragile eagles. It's not like, you know, what you guys hear with some of these um, nutters out in, you know, the far left or like the uh, toxic feminists where they're like, oh, you must have a fragile ego. You man with a fragile ego or you have a big truck. You must have a little pee pee or a fast car. What's wrong with you sort of things? Like, 
that's that's not who the people are with fragile egos. I mean, people people like that that have bought you know big expensive cars and boats and planes and stuff like that. Um, nobody ever looks at them that way in reality. It's just these 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 people that are envious. These are the true people with fragile egos. So let's get into the four major signs of envy. Um, the first one is micro expressions, which is uh, known as dagger eyes. They're hard to spot because they only last for a few seconds. But I guarantee you, I mean, I'm a little bit older than most of you guys watching. I mean, if you're under me, under my age, anyway, I mean, I'm close to 47, 48 now. But you're going to find out, you know, when you look around in life that there's times where at certain events where you might have been doing something great, maybe you had a success in your business, somebody will look at you, you know, kind of like at the corner of their eyes and they, and they you know, they kind of glare at you. They have that, you know, that glint of like envy and like anger and like it's, it's not easy to decipher until you've seen it. It's hard to explain. Um, until you've seen it and it's genuine, you're going to know what it is. Uh, but these micro, ex but these micro expressions do pop up. So you have to be attentive to them. So that's the first sign. The second sign, which is a little more obvious. And this is one that, this is the one that sent chills up my spine when I, when I heard them, you know, describe it in the audiobook. it's called poisonous praise. And what that is, is a disparaging comment cushioned as praise. For example, when you successfully finish a project, they'll comment on how much money you will make rather than praise your hard work completing the project. I'm going to say that again. Poisonous praise is a disparaging comment cushioned as praise. For example, when you successfully finish a project, they will comment about how much money you will make rather than praise your hard work. I can I can give you one example. Actually, I can give you several examples, and I'm going to tie them you know, back a decade into my debt business because uh, between 2000 and... I think 2007 and 2010 for those three years, um, we probably got more awards in those three years in the business for hyper growth, for culture, for all for all all kinds of business accolades. I mean, we were in Profit Magazine several times. Uh, I was featured on the front page of the Toronto Star. I mean, if you guys Google my uh, full name plus the Toronto Star, um, you know, you'll see the article. But um, you know, the biggest newspaper in, in, in Canada featured me and my business on the front page. So word got out about, you know, the successes that I had had in the businesses and the poisonous praise started to come frequent and often. And it, and it sounded a lot like, uh, oh yeah, you know, I can imagine how much money you must, you know, that you must be making not, oh really, you know, you've saved over a hundred million dollars worth of credit card debt and you've gotten, you know, thousands of people out of debt and back on their financial feet. So they, so they could avoid bankruptcy and, you know, like, the standard sort of praise that people that aren't envious of you would give instead what they're giving you is, Oh, you know, I can imagine how much money you must be making off this sort of thing and how rich you must be now and blah, 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 sort of thing. Um, I also heard it recently too. You, you know, if I was, um, for example, during, during COVID, you know, for the last year, whenever somebody would ask, uh, you know, what I was doing at the bank or, um, uh, there was another guy that ran like this uh, consulting firm that had tried to try to you know get into my business and do some work for us. And you know the standard lyrics were, "Oh, you know, COVID must really be driving your uh, business right up, and you you know you guys must be making a ton of money." You know, the, I remember the bankers said it a couple times. There's a couple of different bankers that I had to deal with that were talking you know specifically about how much money you must be making rather than praising you for what you're actually doing to get people out of debt. That's the way that I've always looked at that business was we actually unfuck people's lives and get them out of debt in a fashion that's better and quicker than the conventional methods that are available to them. But the poisonous praise comes from those that envy you. So you have to be aware of that. Keep an eye open, you know, keep an ear open for it too. Um, backbiting. Envious people enjoy talking about the negative aspects. Of, so this is the third one. Backbiting is envious people that enjoy talking about the negative aspects of a person's character, whether it's real or imagined. Um, this is more of a female sort of centric behavior, but I see a lot of guys do this too. Um, it's kind of gossipy. And what they'll do is they'll go looking for anything that can support their narrative. You know, they want to try to discredit you. Um, you know, up, 
up towards the top when I opened this, you know, I was talking about how these people are so dangerous because they really seek to do you harm. They don't want to operate at your level. They want to bring you down to their level, right? So the backbiting is the third one. Let's talk about the last one, which is seesawing, which is the fourth sign of envy. And it's positive and negative uh, actions, meaning they're going to heap on praise, then harsh criticisms, then they're going to warm up you, you know, warm you up again, and then they're going to keep repeating the cycle. I think out of all of those, the most obvious one that you need to be aware of is poisonous praise. Oh, that's great. You must be making a ton of money. Oh, that's great. You know, when are you going to buy us all, you know, whatever sort, you know, sort of thing. And you'll get this from people very, very close to you, maybe even family members, maybe even friends. Um, it's, you know, it's bizarre because it was, it was totally over my head for many, many years until it was defined as poisonous praise and how it's a disparaging comment. Uh, cushioned as praise when in fact it's it's really just like you know shitting on you in an underhanded way um, let me grab the join link for you guys because I'm almost done I've got the types of enviers to cover and then we're almost wrapped up so where is my invite link copy to clipboard all right so if you guys have a question for me tonight join in and ask a question make sure, you have, make sure you've got headphones um, ideally, you know, something wired like this with a microphone in it and a decent internet connection. Um, if your audio sucks and your connection sucks, um, you, you know, you'll get pushed out pretty quickly. So I'll drop that in the chat. Yeah. Uh, Pete said in the chat, poisonous praise sounds like poisonous sarcasm. Let me just scroll up here to see if I missed any of these comments. Yeah. 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 Uh, Raymond says a lot of the haters just want to be just want to use a successful person to gain attention. I'm going to get to that in a minute, actually. Um, these are the levelers. Uh, but yeah, we will definitely cover that very, very shortly. Uh, there's a super chat here from the competent man. He says, gossiping. I've seen this uh, increase a lot of recent years as men act this way instead of working together, undermining each other. Yeah, the, the you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see and it's kind of disturbing to see at the same time because, I mean... Like there's people and things out there that I don't agree with, that are, that I won't co-sign, that I don't like even, but I don't have time in my day to go and make hit pieces on people on YouTube and then, you know, try to disparage them publicly. But that, yeah, you're right. That's like stuff like this, like the gossipy nature, the manufactured indignation. Um, and then you look at it and you kind of peel it back. Like, like there's one guy um, out there, uh, John does this, you know, for the most part, I... I think from modern life dating where he's where he's had like a lot of hate from different people. And then, you know, you'll go and peel back the layers and then you'll go and see who these people really are. Cause they don't usually use their full, you know, like their real names. Like I use my real name. I got nothing to hide. That's why. I mean, I've, I've never been in jail. I've, I don't have a mugshot. Um, but a lot of these guys have mugshots and, and have been in jail and they don't use their real names for that reason. And they flee countries that they're from. Um, it just always unfolds that way. And there's a reason why they're under you and beneath you and they're trying to bring you down to their level. It's because they're shit. It's just, you know, that, that's it. Uh, Daryl says jealousy, you know, confused ad admiration. Let's go to number five types of envier. So the first envier, uh, I think it was Pete's point. It's called the leveler. And the leveler will tear down anyone that's achieved something great and try to bring them down to their mediocre level. They'll never see and appreciate excellence in anybody unless they're dead. These levelers, I mean, you gotta, it doesn't even matter if they're, I don't even care if it's a family member. I don't care if it's a best friend that you've been with for, you know, 20 years of your life and you were brothers from another mother in high school or anything like that. If there's people in your life that are envious of you and you start to recognize these signs, the best thing you can do is cut them off. Just lose their phone number. Don't respond to the phone calls or the texts. I mean, if you got to tell them, you know, let them know, but get them, just get them out of the way. Again, people on the outside, they don't matter. Let these Spurgs, you know, have their little spaz out sessions with their little tiny crew of losers making up shit about you. That isn't true. Let them spaz out. It doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> it's just hilarious. Number two, the self-entitled slacker. 
they feel the world owes them attention and praise, even though they lack the discipline to do the hard work. How many people do you know like that? I can, I would, I would run out of count, counting on my fingers and toes if I'm being honest. There's probably 20 people that I that I've come across, even in the last few years, that I that I would label as a self entitled slacker. Anyway, number three, the status friend. This one's an interesting one because these are the guys that envy you first, and then they try to befriend you. So the status friend, they always measure people via social status. They envy those of a higher status and envy those who enjoy certain privileges. So these are privileges that they're identifying with that they want to enjoy, but they see you enjoy. So, you know, they try to move in, which brings me to the fourth one, which is the attacher. Uh, let me just go to these questions real sec before I deal with the attacher. Raymond says, it's like trying to explain to a crow what it's like to soar like an eagle. They'll never get it. Yeah, it's like trying to explain to a fly, you know, that if you're a bumblebee and you're trying to explain to a fly that honey's better than shit, they just don't get it. The fly is going to pick shit because that's what they are, right? Tuscan Razorbacks, this is great production, extremely beneficial. It's gold information. Thanks, brother. Appreciate that. <clears throat> The attacher. Again, guys, if you want to hop onto the uh, stream, don't pile in at the end because that's always what happens. I've got like 20 guys waiting to ask questions and I got to wrap up the show because at 930, I have to move on to my next project, which is a private call for my group. But there's a stream light, stream yard link. Click it, join through. A bunch of people have been messaging me, asking me questions by DMs. Do them live. It's either book a call or do them live here. I'm before the train wreck, so the free option is live here. Uh, the attacher. They don't have a calling in life, so they attach themselves to people with a sense of purpose. This ties into the status friend. They envy and ultimately attack the person they've attached to. So these guys are dangerous AF, okay? I mentioned earlier at the opening, the, their key goal is to find your weakness and how to hurt you. The attacher is one of the ways that they'll go about it. I've had attachers. They're like, um, what are those sucker fish that are that are always like uh, on top of sharks? You know, the sharks swimming around and these things just kind of suck onto them on the top or bottom of them. That's basically what these losers are. They don't want to do the work in life. They don't. They don't have a clear calling, so they attach themselves to you. So they have some sort of sense of purpose. They envy and ultimately attack the person that they've attached to. I've seen this happen time and time and time and time again. Yeah, lampreys, correct. Yeah, that's what they're called, lampreys. Uh, Alexander says, I'm not black or red pill. I just enjoy your channel because you have a positive message for men. It's better to have a positive mindset and hope to have, sorry, and hope than to have a loser mindset filled with despair. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate that. Yeah, I agree. I mean... A lot of people with their different colored pills. I, <laughs> I did this show on the weekend with my buddy Paul on uh, the stereo app, and some guy uh, asked a question about the white pill. It's like, all right, are we just making up stuff now? Because it's like, you know, we've made up genders. We've made up, you know, things that are offensive. I'm going to be offended by shampoo because I don't have hair. It's like, you know, people are just making up shit now. It's like, let's let's call it the white pill. Okay, let's just move on from that. So watch out for these attachers, guys. Okay. And number five, uh, Adam, I'll get to you in a sec. I see you there in the waiting area. Give me a second. Um, not able to copy chat link to stream here. Okay, somebody that. So again, guys, if you're coming in late, here's the YouTube link. Click the YouTube link because apparently Periscope with Twitter doesn't like taking it for some reason. Head on over to YouTube and join us there. Smash the like button, get those up, and I'll grab you the invite link to ask a question live again. <coughs> this is the StreamYard link. You can hop on in a minute. Um, there's already people starting to, to line up, so don't don't leave it. Uh, the insecure master. They are an insecure person who holds a high position in society, but secretly doubts their worth. Therefore, they envy more talented subordinates. I've worked for a guy um, like this who was in a higher position. I don't know how he got there because he wasn't very good. And I remember, I mean, fuck, I was in my 20s at this time, late 20s. And I remember there was this uh, email that he had to send out explaining something uh, specific to the vice president of the company. He didn't know how to articulate it. So he calls me in his office and he goes, here, sit here, uh, you know, Coop, and, you know, fill this out. That's what they used to call me in the industry, Coop. And he goes, you know, fill this out and, you know, send this over to the VP. And I'm like, 
isn't this your job? Like, why am I doing this for you sort of thing? But the guy always envied the work that I did, you know, for my team. So not that dangerous of a guy. I would, I mean, if I would narrow it down, I'd say keep an eye open for the attachers. Have a sober second thinker looking over your shoulder, making sure they got an eye on you. Um, watch out for self-entitled slackers. And the most important one, which I think is the biggest indicator, which I've seen a number of times in my life, which did pop up and was exposing to risk, was poisonous praise people. Uh, again, that was dispa d disparaging comments cushioned as praise. So something like they'll comment on how much money you're going to make rather than praise your hard work for the completed project. Make sense? Good. Let me grab my headphones and we're going to switch over and take some calls. Um, if you guys want to put in the private chat what it is that you want to talk about, that'll just help me uh, decide who to throw on first. Uh, ideally, you know, related to tonight's cast would, you know, would be awesome as well, too. Um, let's go here. Adam, let's throw you in the cast here. All right. How you doing, bud? I'm very fine. Thank you. And thank you for, uh, for the call-ins. It's really helpful to, uh, um, to, to have the opportunity to talk to you. Um, you got it, man. Fire away. What's your question? Yeah, you're good. Yes. Um, my question is that I don't have direction and I'm looking for guidance uh, what kind of passions, majors, careers, businesses do you think could lead to financial success in life? I'm 19 years old, and uh, that's it. Like, and, and and what is the starting point? For example, I want to open an online business for, for the first time. I'm out of high school, and I don't have any knowledge about it. Where do I start? I find myself can't find the starting point when I have Where no knowledge live, about the start. Uh, I, I, I live in Jordan. Jordan, okay. So you're asking about starting point for a job where yes. you can go and make bank. I can tell you where like the most money that you're going to make is either going to be as a high paid salesperson for high ticket items, yachts, boats, planes, sailboats, expensive luxury cars, shit like that. Uh -huh. C-suite jobs, CEO, CFO, CTO, you know, that kind of stuff, which most people either work their way up to or they gain enough industry experience after 20 years. STEM, science, technology, engineering, mass, you know, projects where you can make over six figures. And even in some parts of the world, I mean, you could have a STEM degree, you could be an engineer or, you know, uh, do something in the sciences and live in a city like New York City, for example, making $150,000 mm -hmm. a year. And that's just average, right? Like that's really not enough to like stand out from the crowd. So we've got um, mm -hmm. sales, C-suite, uh, STEM, Entrepreneur is my preferred uh, path, is what I would recommend for guys to consider yes. um, as and the best path. Sorry, go ahead. And that's what I want to know about. How, uh, how do I start that? How do I like, open my first online business when I have no knowledge about it or about in entrepreneurship? Like The, the most important yeah. skill that you must have to be <clears throat> successful as an entrepreneur, specifically and in life, is problem solving abilities, right? So you're asking me, well, how do I get right. started, you know, and start a business? How do I start an online business? How do I do this? How do I do that? Every single entrepreneur that's done that faced the exact same problem that, that you're asking right now. But rather than go and asking somebody for the cheat codes to life and how do I successfully navigate this, yes. they just went looking for the answers and solved the problem themselves. So rather than asking what's, what's step A, B, C, I would say start to develop your problem solving skills. By looking by yourself and not asking for cheat codes. No, but you're asking me to tell you how to get a business off the ground, like where to get started. And I'm telling you, learn problem solving skills because I mean, you need to understand marketing. You need to understand accounting. You need to understand sales. Yeah. Probably. Okay. If I were to narrow would it down, would you recommend the book or yeah? Uh, there's lots of books I've uh, recommended on business. If you if you go to the top pin comment on on any of my vi um, uh, videos, you'll find um, my Amazon bookstore, and I've got a lot of recommended reads in there. Some of them are business books, but to the point of the two main skills that 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 you have to master as an entrepreneur, it's going to be sales and marketing. <clears throat> because if you don't have you know the ability to sell 
and you don't know how to market the product. I mean, you also have to have business strategy skills as well, which ties into problem solving. But, you know, sales and marketing, you know, would be more towards the top. You also have to have a great product or service or subscription model, whatever it is that you're offering. But that's how you get started is, is, is it all boils down to have immaculate problem solving skills. Can you solve problems? And I'm not just talking about like a math equation on a piece of paper because that's bullshit because that's what they teach boys in, in school is, you know, color within the lines, cross your T's, dot your I's and make sure E equals MC squared. No, 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 no. I'm talking about I give a hammer, a nail, a bunch of two by fours and some plywood uh, and maybe like a lawnmower engine and you can figure out how to build a plane and fly it across the Grand Canyon within 24 hours. Like those are the kind of problem solving skills that I would say focus on rather than basic shit like math skills. You see what I'm saying? Like it's creative problem solving awesome. is what I'm talking about. Yes. So uh, just go and um, uh, acquire these skills by uh, like re regular sales job jobs, for example. Is that well, what if you're going to get into sales jobs, move your way into high ticket sales, sell yachts, sell jets, right? Sell uh, Rolls yes. Royce. Like those are the kind of things that you want to move into selling, but just get started. So I Don't... Should... Stop, so stop, I shouldn't stop. Be focused. hang on, hang on, hang on. Stop, stop, stop okay, asking, sorry. how do I go and make bank? Start mm -hmm. working towards solving your problem. And one of the things that you can do is study the greats go and read some biographies i've i've got my favorite biographies in my amazon bookstore richard branson's losing my virginity is a fantastic biography um the everything store on jeff bezos is a fantastic biography um you know popular to contrary you know belief with social media and the news mackenzie bezos is hardly even mentioned in that damn book but everybody's like oh you know she earned half that money because she was married to him and she helped him start up yeah. the business yeah. no <laughs> he exactly. did it all okay so just just start studying the greats because success leaves leaves clues so rather than what course do i enroll into what job do i get learn how to solve problems and read books on people that have been great at solving problems understandable Make sense? Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Um, see ya. All right. Got uh, three more guys here in the waiting area. Uh, oh, hang on. We got here a guy in that settlement in the U.S. This will be interesting. So Jacob, let's let's throw Jacob in because this is something I know like the back of my hand. What's up, dude? Hey, how's he going, Rich? Thanks doing for having me on. Yeah. Do you want to tell me which company you work for? Yeah, sure. Why not? Uh, I work for uh, Freedom Debt Relief. Oh, okay. Andrew Hauser is a friend of mine. Oh yeah, he's a good guy. <laughs> Very. I friendly. like him. Yeah. I uh, I specifically work in the uh, the consolidation loan uh, division. Okay. Cool, yeah, it's cool. great. Yeah, it's um. I started out as one of those uh, middle of the mall kiosk hustlers. I went through a. Uh, a very uh, tragic breakup. That's when I kind of woke up and I wanted to win this girl back. And I, uh, these guys over at Freedom, they gave me a chance. Okay. And so that's how I got here. But um, are you in uh, San, San, what is the town name? San Mateo, I think was where their head office was. Th that's, yeah, the, the, the head office is in California, but I'm here in uh, um, Tempe, Arizona. Okay. You're in the Arizona spot. Okay. Cool. So what's your question? My question is, um, you know, I just worry with the um, political climate, how progressive things are becoming uh, here in the States. You know, do you think debt settlement, this industry is going to last? Um, why do you think it's not going to last? So let's start with that. Uh, I may, that, that's a good question. Um, the, from, from what I can see, from what I'm sensing from these politicians, uh, the left, the Democrats, they're all about, um, you know, raising the standard of living up and uh, forgiving the mistakes of UBI. people. Yeah. Yeah. UBI, so on and so forth. And I get the sense that they're not really wanting to hold uh, people accountable. And especially in regards to debts, student loans, this yep. and this and that. And uh, it worries me because that's that's my industry. So, you know, it's uh, what what can potentially happen when people aren't held accountable for their uh, financial mistakes or you know, just their uh, yeah. financial, um, you know, do you, do, you, do you feel what I'm saying? No, I get it. Like, that's a great question. And... And there's and there's two sides to this one coin. So on the one side of the coin, you've got um, the politicians who want more votes, and they realize that 
the more people they can have sucking off the teat of the state, reliant on that for a source of income and for their standard of living and for their core happiness, the better off they're going to be. So they're basically selling long-term misery, you know, which is, which is cloaked and disguised. You know how nonprofit credit counselors are often called uh, kinder, friendlier collection agencies to the banks? Yes. Right. That's, that's kind of what the government is, right? Like they're trying to be kinder, friendlier, um, and, you know, supportive to society, but it's bullshit. That's, that, that's not what they are. Kind of like the nonprofit ca- credit counselors are not what they're selling people. So the problem is, is people are stupid. Like the average IQ is lower than a hundred, right? Like people aren't bright. And if, you know, the government says, here's some free shit, take it. Being like, okay, we'll take that. Like people in the US, they don't want freedom. They don't want sovereignty. What what they want is they want free shit, right? right. So they're going to keep voting for more policies that do that. So let's uh, forgive debt. Let's let's lower interest rates. Let's you know give away free shit. Correct. Now the problem with that is that the world runs on money. So we on the other side of the coin, you've got the financial institutions who make a shit ton of money off interest. Um, I've, I've been in the business for a long, long time, as you know, and I was an insider in the collection industry um, for almost as long as well. And it, it's, it's mind boggling how much money they make off service interest payments on debt and how long it keeps people in debt. They make so much profit. It is ridiculous. Now, are they going to give that up? I don't think so. They're going to go down kicking and screaming. So There's going to have to be a happy compromise somewhere in the middle. Do I think that the debt relief industry is a good place to be for a young guy today? I'm going to say no. And I own one of those businesses. Now, now why do you say that? What's the big, bright future, right? Like, how are you going to put a dent in the universe, coloring within the lines, crossing the T's and dotting the I's for you know, this, this industry, which is, which has found a way to get people out of debt, which by the way, over time is harder and harder to execute. There's more and more regulations. The same thing here in Canada, there's more and more regulations and there's, there's very high penalties if the process is not executed properly. Right. Um, I mean, you're always walking this fine line. Like it always felt like you're on this tightrope you know, in this industry. And I'm sure, you know, the guys like Andrew and Brad, you know, feel the same way still, but I'm not in the States, so I don't have all the insider details today, you know, to be on, be on the up and up. But I would say, you know, as a general rule, mm. find something else to do, dude. That is so, you know, and I, I can appreciate that response. You know, I went from, as I mentioned here earlier, I went from working in the middle of the mall to, um, you know, living with a roommate. How old are you? Uh, just turned 25. Okay. So what do you want to do with your life? Like, where do you see yourself at 35? Let's say. I want to make money. I want to be in control of something of my own. That feeling is within me. Okay. Um, you know, doing what I'm not sure I had skills growing up that, you know, perhaps I could utilize. I was always real good at graphic design. I was always very, very comfortable in front of people. That's how I got into sales. But uh, biz- I want to own a business. I want to be running something, but I'm not sure what it would be just yet. Okay. Well, you have to start moving towards that if you want to hit that by 35, because more often than not, nine times out of 10, a business is going to fail. So if you go by the stats, you're probably going to have to step- start up 10 businesses for one success, and you're going to need a good one to two year run to, to, to figure out if the business is going to be successful or not. Mm-hmm. So if you, you know, so if you start to look at the math, it could take you, you know, on a good run, 10 years, on a shitty run, maybe 20 years to figure it out, right? You know, for you to get to that point, depending on how successful you are, how much help you have along the way, how much luck, you know, yeah. comes your way, you know, there's a whole bunch of factors to look at, you know, how how well honed your decision-making skills are. There's a lot really, you know, to look at there and unpack, but you're not going to achieve that goal, you know, working for somebody else. Yeah. And again, you know, I talked to the guy earlier. What was his name? Adam from Jordan. High ticket sales. You know, you're selling jet planes, yachts, sailboats, Rolls Royce. You're a C-suite, you know, job, right? CTO, CFO, CEO, STEM. Something that pays big in STEM, obviously. Entrepreneur is big too. 
And there's other professional, you know, designations like lawyer, doctor, you know, accountant, you know, stuff like that. But those would be the main ones. Like if you really want to put a dent in the universe and you want to have a big, bright future for yourself, you're going to have to start looking into moving in that direction and getting out of what you're doing, you know, in the day to day job. Because, you know, uh, um, who was it that said it? I, I think it was Kevin O'Leary that said something like, you know, the most addictive thing that they give people is a salary, you know, like a biweekly salary, because it makes you give up your hopes and dreams. Yeah. Now, I, I do have another question. Um, uh, do you mind if I ask another question? Sure. One more. Yeah. Um, real, real quick. I, um, I'm at the, I feel like I'm at this, uh, this transition point in my life where I'm giving up a lot of uh, interest passions I had growing up that I was very, very much uh, obsessed with. Um, Why? Why are you uh, giving them up? Because I don't feel like they make money. I don't okay. feel like they provide a solution for enough people to give me the lifestyle and, uh, you know, fulfill that part of me, that void. Why don't they make you money? Like, what are the passions? Like, what are we talking about here? Uh, uh, growing up, I, it was, uh, I was constantly doing art, graphic design, drawing. Uh, I mean, from, uh, I mean, as long as I remember from when I was a little kid all the way up until high school. I was going to go to school for graphic design, but I, I chose not to simply because I don't feel like the money's there. Mm-hmm. And I don't know of a way that I could, you know, make, you know, seven figures drawing. It just seems like a, an absolute dream to me. I mean, unless I was going to some sort of high art form. Well, I mean, there's like, I watched a video on Alex Becker's channel the other day and he fucking sold a red square on, you know, as an NFT for like, I don't know, 200 bucks or something. Like it was literally a square that was colored in red. Right. So there, so there's some weird shit selling, you know, in, in art as NFTs in some cases for millions. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's not like you can't make money at it, but it, but like the long, like the long and short of it really is, is there's not a lot of really wealthy artists out there. I mean, you're an artistic guy. I get it. You know, yeah. you're good at it. You like it. It's something that you probably lose track of time when you do yep. the shit that I like that doesn't make money. Like I like, uh, I don't know, like, you know, the art of bonsai for me is fucking interesting. You know, yeah. um, I used to like racing cars, but there's no money in racing. Like I found out, you know, when I got deep enough into racing and I worked as a, uh, uh, part of a pit crew at Moss Sport here for two races once. And I'm like, you know, like I wanted to get the inside scoop and I'm like, so, you know, what kind of money is made in this? And where does it go? And you know, how do you race sponsors? And I was like, there's no money in racing. Like most guys that race do it as a fucking passion just because they like going fast. Actually, most guys that race cars are entrepreneurs that have enough money to blow that they sponsor their own race car. Ah, okay. So, and, and to clarify my question, I worry sometimes that perhaps it's too late to find a new skill to master a new Dude, skill. you're 25, man. <laughs> you got, no, no, you, you got know, lots of time. No, but is it is, okay? Okay. You got lots of time. Don't even, don't even talk like, like I'm in my late forties and I started doing this only a few years ago. Like this was a new skill for me, right? Like, you know, it's, 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 it's outside of my normal comfort zone with what I'm an expert at. Like I know the credit and collection industry, like the back of my hand, right? Mm-hmm. Like I know a lot of people in the industry. Like I know the people that started up your company, right? Like I know a lot of people in the United States that run in the debt settlement space and even creditors too, and law firms and guys that, you know, were lobbyists and all that sort of stuff. It's not what I want to do though, right? This right. is this is a new skill that I've learned. So don't say that you can't learn a new skill at 25. That's that's bullshit, man. You got you got lots of runway ahead of you. The problem is, is don't fucking waste it, right? Because right. if you let five, 10 years burn and you're like, all right, I'm 35. What have I done with my life? You're going to be fucked, right? Because right? you just burned through 10 years. You'll never get time back. You can always make money back. You know, you can go and spend money on something and, and fuck it up and have it flop. Like I've, I've thrown money at some businesses. I've, you know, thrown money at some crypto. I've thrown some money at some stocks and it's gone nowhere. You know, it's just poof. It's just evaporated. It doesn't matter. Right. I, I, I may have spent $50,000 learning that lesson. It was a fifty thousand dollar education, but I'll never make that same mistake again. But I still have the time because I was efficient with it. See what right. I'm saying? Yeah, I see what you're saying, Rich. I appreciate the guidance. All right, tell Andrew I said hi. I will, sure. <laughs> see you, man. Peace.
Um, Alex says, this is why I love Rich's content. It helps me keep things in perspective that it, that I am very fortunate to be where I'm at for 24 years old. Right on. Um, okay, in the private chat, guys, in the waiting area, let me know what it is that you want to talk about. Uh, Alex. Alex has a question here about his dad. All right, let's do this. What's shaking, Alex? You're going to have to unmute yourself. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. What's your question? Okay. Alex, what's your question? Basically, um, my, my dad, can you hear me? What's your question, Alex? Okay, you're going to get removed. Guys, make sure you've got your audio sorted out. Um, let me grab these super chats here. Fran, uh, are you getting the SMP? What is the SMP sexual marketplace? That's, that's what it stands for in, you know, the red pill space. I don't know what that is. Um, I cut off a toxic friend, which resulted in him showing up to my soccer game uninvited and attacked me physically for not texting him back. <laughs> Good. Cool. The guy just made a fool out of himself publicly and just gave you even more of a reason to cut him off permanently, right? Simple as that. <laughs> Fucking awesome. That is great. The guy just did you a favor. Um, Cal, I'm going to pull you in, see what see what's up on your end. I see you got headphones on, so I know your audio is mm -hmm. good. Sweet. Hey, Rich, can you hear me? You're loud and clear. Which question, bro? Cool. Um, so I'm in the Airbnb business. Um, okay. I bought a house in Ottawa, and I did notice the thing you were talking about, the poisonous praise. Yep. Um, I noticed that I've done that too in the past, um, but I just thought, like, you know, that's how I was raised, and people have said that to me and I thought that's just how the business world works. Like, Oh, you did something cool. Okay. You're make a lot of money. You know? No, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't go that way. Like when you get yeah. around other successful entrepreneurs, like one of the things that you guys really have to understand too is when is when you have a win, when you're successful, take a look at your five closest friends, you know, in that inner mm -hmm. perimeter family members, even and friends and see who doesn't applaud you because they're spot. Because their silence to me speaks louder than those that do applaud me, right? Why is Bob being quiet after I just did, you know, whatever, you know, mastery sort of thing? See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to be more conscious of that going forward. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, uh, I had a place in Ottawa. Uh, I was Airbnb. -ing it. it was like real close to downtown. Uh, sold it because the house prices in Ottawa just like spiked like crazy. Mm -hmm. And we made a good profit off it. Uh, thinking about moving to BC, specifically Kelowna, and doing the same kind of thing there, like getting a house there, Airbnb mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, what are your thoughts of moving from Ontario to BC since you're Canadian as well? Um, a lot of people ask me about Canada. Fuck. I mean, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of Canada anymore. Right. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm here because I have family here and I'm raising a kid, so I'm not, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon, but as soon as I have the option to spend more time out of Canada, I will. Um, I mean, you're basically asking me like, what do you, you know, like, what do you like better? Do you like constipation or diarrhea? <laughs> it's the same thing. It's okay. shit, right. <laughs> Cologne is nice. though. like I have, mm -hmm. I have friends out there. Um, a buddy of mine, actually Brad was, um, on my playing the wind series a few months ago just built a custom place out there. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's nicer than Ottawa. Uh, but it's still in Canada. The taxes are super high. Um, I mean, I was talking to, um, I mean, I don't want to give it away cause I got something coming down the pipelines in the next week. Um, but the tax rate on certain luxury items in BC are going to be as high as I believe 36%. Okay. Didn't so, I mean, yeah, okay, you live in a nice place of Canada, but when you want to go and, you know, spend some money on a nice car, let's say, or a mm -hmm. boat or a fucking yacht or something like that, a sailboat, it's going to cost you a fortune in taxes, right? So mm. it's nicer than Ottawa, but but if I could choose, mm. like if I could go back in a time machine and pick somewhere else to live, it would not be in Canada. I would go somewhere south, warmer climate, more personal freedom 
None of this <laughs> lockdown bullshit. None of this like leftist, like globalist, liberalist agenda where everybody gets offended by basic shit like a plastic potato. None of that stuff is of any interest to me. But again, you know, you're asking me, do you like diarrhea? Do you like constipation? Well, it's shit. Just pick, you know, just pick one basically. Right. Okay. Yeah, I will consider southern parts of America, like maybe Mexico or something too. Mexico is nice. Cool. Thanks. All right. Peace. Yeah. Uh, Frito, new member. By the way, guys, if you're a channel member, every other Monday I do a uh, Q and A. So there's tier two, which is a Q and A tier. So after the before the train wreck, I drop a link on the community tab for members that want to come in and ask private questions as a group. Um, and we've got Rich Cooper's used TRT needle in the house with a two dollar super chat. Sipping eight gang chicken in, right on. I'm going to do a video soon, by the way, for you guys on uh, the good, bad, and ugly of uh, TRT. Um, it's been a few years now, so I'm going to break it down for you uh, with some more clarity and hindsight. Let me see here what we got in the private. Uh, Alex says he sorted out his audio, so let's give you another chance here. All right. Hey, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and good. Hi, Rich. Basically, I wanted to ask, my dad's aging, he's in his 60s, and I'm just in my early 20s. I'm trying to make uh, make the best of my life and realize the best version of myself. Mm. And I'm, I'm struggling to respect my dad because in hindsight, in retrospect, he hasn't made much of his life. But I, at the same time, I appreciate that he is ultimately my father. But he is very, he does have a sort of very blue pill philosophy. Okay. And obviously, I appreciate at his age, he, he's unlikely to listen to the thoughts I have being only in my 20s on how he's lived his life, etc. Okay, and so you asked about making amends, but what do you need to make amends on? Like if, like if you guys got a rift between you, you you've, you've had a disagreement? Yeah, we hardly speak. I mean, I, I went back to my, his house during Christmas. And mm -hmm. for example, he was saying to me things like, because I'd, I'm tr trying to bodybuild at the moment, get um larger he was he said to me i used to i used to work out but i stopped because i found that i got too muscular mm. and that made literally zero sense to me because i don't stand, understand personally how a man can become too muscular mm. and so it just and uh, for example i was cooking six eggs in the morning and he wanted to know why i'd cooked so many eggs and to me that was just normal because to get enough protein you need to be eating a lot of eggs so it's just little things like this I struggled was to it, see was it, to... was it poisonous praise though? Like I used to date this chick in my twenties when I, um, like I've always been pretty strong and I've always lifted. Right. So kind of like you, I get the need for calories and nutrition, but, um, like this chick I was dating, her friends would always make disparaging comments, you know, in the form of poisonings, you know, poisonous praise, like, Oh, can you tell the Calvin Klein model over there to pull his pants up? Because like the V taper showing a little too much, like when you're at the pool or something like that. And it's like, you know, poisonous praise like that is a problem. That's envy. It doesn't sound like envy to me. Like, it doesn't sound like that's the problem. It just sounds like that he's disagreeing on the amount of eggs that you're consuming for breakfast. Where do you live? Do you live in the UK? Yeah. Look, my dad's from the UK. He's cheap as fuck. Okay. So, you know, if the heat's turned up too high or you flush the toilet too many times. Like, when I was a kid, my dad would, like, explain how to use toilet paper properly so that you could get the most out of like three sheets, you know, folded, you know, the right way sort of thing. Yeah. Is it, is it maybe something like that? Uh, it may be, but I just feel in general, I struggle to respect his philosophy in life in general, because he's not at a position in my life that I would want to be if I was his age, if that makes sense. Yeah, so you wouldn't trade places with him. Fine, I get it. Like, I wouldn't trade places with my dad either, right? It yeah. doesn't mean that I don't love him and he's not my father. Right. That's fine. I mean, like, what is it that you're hoping to change here, right? He's not going to change. My old man's right. not going to change. Like, you know, you can't teach an old old dog new tricks. I see the... Uh, you know, I see the parental units um, every couple of weeks. We get together, we shoot the shit. You know, if you go anywhere near talking about politics or certain things, I know it's going to end in an argument with my old man, so I just don't, right? So there's right. certain areas that you kind of stay away from. Um, 
I mean, you want people to respect you. You know, you want people in your life, like family members, like your parents should admire you for your successes. If they're making disparaging comments about you or underhanded comments or poisonous praising her, for example, that'd be a reason to keep them at arm's length and maybe just see them once or twice a year. But if it's not that bad, it's just, okay, I know I can't talk to my old man about certain political stuff. So I just don't fucking have those conversations. And he knows that too. And we get on just fine outside of that. Right. Okay. I would just pick those battles a little more carefully. That's all. Okay. All right, man. Well, all right, peace. Okay. Uh, JP with the four ninety nine super chat says, "I feel like people don't make jokes with me because they feel bad for me because they know I get easily offended. How do I man up?" Well. Join a dojo and learn how to kick ass and get your ass kicked, I would say, would be a good place to start if you get easily offended. Uh, read my book, The Unplugged Alpha. It's on Amazon. It's It just got released in Audible on uh, last week, like on Thursday or something like that. So start with that. And let's see here in the private chat. I got another 20 minutes or so, guys. So if you have a question here, let me grab the join link again. Um, if you have a question, hop on. And let me drop it in here. If you got good audio in your setup so it doesn't uh, give you a hard time. Frito says with a $5 super chat, hey man, been writing a red pill book, wondering if you could help me get in touch with your publisher. <laughs> I self-published, dude. Um, I I put it out myself. So a lot of people have, have asked me about writing and, um, you know, how to get a book in front of people. I would say, do not write a book unless you have an audience. Just because nobody's going to read it. I mean, you're going to put it out and you're going to get a handful of sales and nothing's going to happen. If you don't have an audience to sell it to, what's the point in putting it out there? Um, and don't send me your book to read. I, uh, I get books every single month or two from people Hey, I self-published this book. I'd like you to read it. I don't have time to read books. Like I barely have time to listen to full audio books from guys like Robert Greene because his book's 28 hours long. So I'll go and grab the full book for when I have time, but I'll listen to the summary, which is like an hour long. Um, so my recommendation is don't write books if you don't have an audience to sell it to. Um, publishers don't want um, anything to do with anybody that 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 doesn't have the ability to sell books. Um that's what I've learned from my experience. But go follow James Altucher if you want to learn more about publishing books. Um, he's got a lot of good blog, blog posts on stuff like that. So you'll probably get some use out of it that way. Um, guys, in the private chat, if you're in the waiting area, let me know what it is that you want to uh, talk about so I can uh, decide who goes on first. Adam says, hey, Rich, I'm in the Cultivate Crypto class. Awesome. Good. I'm glad you are. Uh, just wondering if you have any advice on what exchanges are good for Canada. Bitbuy.ca is the best on-ramp, in my opinion, to uh, start with crypto, um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, if you want to get that. That's the main on-ramp here. Um, their fees are pretty reasonable, and they're pretty easy to deal with. Um, that's who I use anyway. Uh, do, do, do. And Vincent McLeod, no question, Rich. Just keep up the good work. Thank you. And Dave says 49 pages into the book, enjoying it. Good. I'm glad. Again, it's on Audible too. So if you guys like to listen to books, I narrate it myself. Go to Audible. Boom. You're there. Um, let me give this to James McCarthy. All right, James, what is your question? James, are you there? Yeah, it's a little bit laggy. Thank you for having me, Mr. Richard. Just one question. Um, because Dan Balzerian, um, he had a bad reputation or something like as a, I don't know if he was a life coach, but I want to um, hire a life coach. Uh, I, I just want to know, how, like, when it comes to vetting your guru, I think you touched up on that on Rule Zero or something like that. Remember? Mm -hmm. I don't think I was but on like, that episode. Uh, how, but yeah, how do I, I know that? So you want to hire I, I Dan Balzerian as a life coach? No, 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 no. I'm just saying because like there's a lot of fakes. How, how how do I spot one? Since like you're a good established guru, like 
or it's um what do you need help teacher with? i just want to know how could i get like the I, I so that i won't get scammed or something like that sir what do you need help with um uh, mostly like um engineering and stuff like that like for software I, i'm barely starting out on coding like coding apps Okay, uh, I'm I'm still not clear on what it is that you're trying to solve. Like, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, like so that I. Uh, oh yeah. So before you ask about vetting your guru or how to avoid getting scammed, you should be clear on what problem it is that you're trying to solve. Oh well, just that on um, just vetting, just vetting people in general, and and also. Since I'm on, on the coding side, just mm -hmm. also that. Okay, so since you're like more experienced, like. So what it boils down to me before I hire anybody to offer me any kind of advice on a topic that I'm seeking answers on, first I'll ask my friends. Hey, this is what I'm stuck on. I need somebody that can help solve this problem. Who who is it that you can recommend? <clears throat> and then what I'll do is I'll take a look at them, and then I'll ask myself. If this person is truly an expert in the topic that they're an expert on, where's their proven track record of success? Would I want to trade my life with, you know, for them? I mean, if if I'm looking for somebody to make me like if I'm already a seven fill seven figure millionaire and I want to become an eight figure millionaire, I want to look at an eight fill eight figure millionaire and say, okay, can this person show me how to get from a seven-figure position to an eight-figure position? And are they truthfully an eight-figure position millionaire? That's what I would be looking, right? Would I exchange my life for their life? Are they better off than me? Do they actually know what they're talking about? Do they have a proven track record of success? Because bullshit baffles brains. And there's a lot of fucking scammers out there on you know, the YouTubes. Even in the space in like, you know, if, if you want to call it the manosphere or the red pill space or whatever, there's a lot of scammers out there that like to sell crap and stories to people that aren't bright enough to understand that they're full of crap, if you know what I'm saying. Um, and they do quite well yeah. with selling selling some of the crap. But I can look at anybody. Like I can basically look at anybody's life, you know, their social media feed. If they're a YouTuber, I can look at their life, and I can tell you if they're full of shit or not, with with probably about ninety percent accuracy. Right. It's just a skill that that, you know, you hone over time after being burned by some people. How old are you? Twenty nine. Twenty nine. OK, so by twenty nine, you should be getting better at this. If you're 20 and you've been burned like once or twice, I'd be like, OK, you know, consider that a thousand, two thousand dollar lesson. You just went to school and you got schooled. Right. But if it keeps happening into your 30s over and over again, uh, you're doing something wrong. Like you have to hone the skill of like vetting these like people that are making promises to you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Richard. You know, I thought I'd check in since you're more experienced mm -hmm. and now with your um, advice, I could like get a better um, clear, okay, like, cool. clear thoughts over this. Thank All you, right. man. Thanks. All right. Um, private chat and see what we got here running a business and thinking of moving out of my parents house running a business from your parents house okay ibra ibra i don't know if i'm pronouncing that right but you're muted yeah that's correct okay what's your question so just to give you a little bit of brief so i started my uh, construction business two years ago mm -hmm. at 24 i'm 26 now so basically i just specialize in exterior cladding in the Toronto region and GTA. Okay. So because the job that I'm doing and the trade that I'm in, my income, like I don't have an income and I don't know where the next job is going to come in. Okay. So, but I do want to move out at the same time, but I'm worried that if I stop making money from my business, then I'll struggle to pay rent. Okay. Um, and just putting some fear in. When you say exterior cladding, like what are you talking about? Like vinyl siding? You're talking about stucco? You're talking about masonry work? I do stucco and stone. Like okay. I have guys that I hired. Okay. So, so you're basically the marketing guy and then you contract the jobs to guys that you have in your Rolodex, right? So I do like sales and marketing mainly. Mm -hmm. As when I find a job, I like my dad is in the trade for 20 years, but he doesn't speak a word of English. 
Okay. He, he just knows he's an expert when it comes to plastering. Here's here's a fucking pain point for me when it comes to dealing with contractors because I have I have some exterior work that I need to get done on my house, kind of in the space that you're in. And for the last two years for the life of me, I can't find a contractor that's competent enough to get it done properly and waterproofed. Um, every single time I deal with a contractor, it is a fucking disappointment. They're incompetent. They lie. Um, they don't quote the job properly. They don't show up when they're supposed to show up. If you can solve those problems, I think that you can stand out from the crowd and you should have no problem booking jobs. Yeah, so, so far, that's what I've been focusing on because that's what I noticed seeing all these contractors do. And this year, I actually made quite a bit of money. So I do have over like uh, 200K saved up. But at the oh, same time- Oh, then why time, are you still living with your parents then? So, but I have to buy a truck. I have to buy a trailer. I have to buy a storage. Okay, so you've got 200K saved up in the business. You don't actually have 200K yourself. So 100K is invested in the stocks portfolio and I have you know 100K in the bank. Okay, but is it but is it your business's money or is it your money? It's my money. The business okay. doesn't have that much money because I pay myself first. Okay, so you okay, so you've paid yourself out. You've paid taxes on it. So the two hundred grand is your money. Yeah, but I do have student loans about forty two thousand. Hold on a dollars. second. That doesn't make any sense because if you're running a contracting business, the business would pay for your truck. You wouldn't. I, you wouldn't move I, the money from the business to yourself after paying taxes and then buy the truck with that money. So the thing is, when I first started, I did not invest in the truck. So what I do is, for now, when I find a job, I have a guy that I pay him hourly, like thirty-five dollars an hour, and he has mm -hmm. a big sprinter. Okay. Every time, every time he uses, I use a sprinter to bring material to the site. I pay him like five hundred bucks a month extra. Or worst case scenario, I rent the scaffolding. I rent a U-Haul to deliver it. So yeah, that's yeah, yeah. how I've been doing it for the past two years. Because I was well, scared to invest in a truck and stuff. Like that. Where do you live? Like downtown Toronto core, like the expensive parts of the city? Uh, no, I live in Don Mills, Eglinton, okay. with my parents. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I would, I would aim to solve the problems that I mentioned earlier. Stand out from the crowd, and I would offer a guarantee, an ironclad fucking guarantee that somebody can sue you into the Stone Age in if you don't up uphold it, and you will be busier than any other contractor out there. I promise you, because if if I've come across this problem, that means everybody else has come across this problem. And it's fucking annoying as hell. Especially, like, I would serve the high end. Like, serve high end people that are in million dollar plus homes that don't have time to deal with bullshits and incompetence. Um, serve them. Charge them a, a premium. Offer them an ironclad guarantee. You should be booked back to back. Like, you should be telling people... I'll book you, I'll guarantee you, but I can't service this for like 60 days because I'm so busy right now. You'll like you'll have no trouble moving out of your parents' house if you can solve that problem. Right now you're kind of on the precipice. Like, yeah, it would be a bit of a risk for you to move out and like, you know, take on the burden of some extra monthly expenses, but it's it's not a deal breaker. I mean, you could do it or you could not do it. What I would say is solve that main problem, boast about it, offer a solid, you know, guarantee and focus on the high-end space. Thanks for the tip. All right, man. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Um, masonries are in demand. Yeah, they are. Uh, masonries in the states make a hundred thousand if they are journeymen. Yep. Gluing stones together pays well. It does. Um, let's see what we got here, Gabriel. I'm going to put you on. And I got like 15 minutes left, so let's get done as many as we can. What's up, brother? Hey, Rich. Thanks for having me on your show. What's shaking? Uh, well, I'm from Brazil. I'm living in the USA, Michigan. Uh, mm -hmm. Pretty close to you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm turning. I'm turning 30 years old in April. Uh, I'm a nurse. Finish up my PhD in neuroscience. I'm starting a new job soon. Uh, it's paying around, you know, uh, high five figures. Um, it's exciting. This new job, I'm going to be starting a clinical analysis lab and a research lab, and uh, I will be running both. Mm -hmm. I'm selling my house um, uh, and making around 30K on the sale and moving to this new city for the new job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have a passion, which is uh, my dad uh, owned restaurants in the past, and I came uh, 
to Michigan and, uh, you know, uh, craft beer and uh, uh, wineries here is a big thing. And um, I, I had this uh, innovative idea for a, a beverage restaurant business. And I just finished writing a, a business plan. Uh, my question to you is um, if I, I would like um, to find people to help me uh, to invest in this business, uh, an investor. This is a uh, restaurant? Yeah, a restaurant. Why uh, the hell would you want to open up a restaurant in an environment where the government shuts down restaurants because of a fucking flu? That kills it, nobody, by the way. 99.9% yeah. .9 of people survive it if they get it. So, uh, you know, being a scientist, uh, uh, I totally get it, uh, the frustration. And uh, today I, I was uh, reading an article that just came out saying that the six feet and three feet uh, doesn't make any difference. So imagine. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's just set that aside. But what I'm saying is that the <laughs> government can shut down the economy at any time when this mm -hmm. happens again. Um, and the, and it will, because the more they can shut down the economy, the more people they can put on you know, welfare, universal basic income or whatever the fuck they want to call it, you know, the free money that they pass out to people. Um, and then that gives them more control, which gives them more votes for bigger government. Um, I would I would never get into anything with food services ever again. Fuck that. I mean, grocery stores, yeah. Distribution centers for produce and for food, yeah, absolutely, because people have to eat. But restaurants get shut down now. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the last year, I've seen... My favorite Indian restaurant shut down. Thank God the Japanese guy is still around doing sushi. Um, but two steakhouses closed down. There's a lot of restaurants around here that have, that have closed down because the government forced them to not serve people in a restaurant. And people don't want to do takeout in an inconvenient fact. My view is stay the fuck away from anything with food services, man. Restaurant right. will. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it was a good piece of advice. Michigan's a bad state for that too, right? Like Michigan's been locked down hard. Yeah. Well. Yeah. The governor here been. Uh, so I mean, if you do it, I would I would move to a friendlier state that's not going to um, impose those kind of restrictions. I know Florida's good. Texas is good. So if yeah. you do it, I mean, if your heart's like set on it, like I want to do this, I like to, I want to serve, you know, Brazilian meat on a stick, sword or whatever, like you know, whatever the thing is that you're going to build. Do it in a state that's at least friendly to business. Yeah. Yeah. Advice taken. Thank you very much, Rich. All right, man. See ya. Good night. Peace. Santiago, what's up, my Mexican brother? How's it going, Rich? How good are you? Man. How you been? Hey. Doing good. Awesome. You enjoying it? I, I, I enjoyed it, and I'm going to get you to sign it. That's cool. my, pur my purpose. That's why I got it. So okay. I had a quick question. So... It, you were saying about going up the uh, administrative ladder to get to a CEO position or something like that. Yeah. So most of the people that are in those positions, most of them seem to be really agreeable all the time and really nice, but deep inside they are not, right? Like you've said. So how, how do you go or how would you suggest about going about doing that? And because if you... The easiest way is just to save effort and make your own company, right? But yes. the, the difficult part is going through, going up and up and up and up and up the ladder and going up uh, and people will become envy of you. So the, the better yeah. you do your job, the more people around you will become jealous of what you're doing. Correct. So it requires quite a bit of skill to get there. So how would you suggest about handling that? Because it's kind of a, a weird situation where most people find uh, you don't want someone that says yes all the time and it's really agreeable to be your boss because saying yes to everything is uh, well if i, well, if I had to choose right? you know between a c-suite job you know working my way up to it or being an entrepreneur with less than 10 employees with i can call myself whatever the fuck i want you know, I can call myself a CEO. I can call myself God of the universe. I can call myself president of the manosphere if I'm an idiot too, right? There's all kinds of different ways to yeah, do it. Totally. <laughs> but you can do it yourself as an entrepreneur much quicker with less resistance, with less people, okay. you know, trying to push you out of the way. Everybody that I've seen in a successful C-suite job in large corporations, um, I'm talking financial institutions, mortgage <laughs> companies, private equity firms, investment firms, yeah, they pay a lot of money. You know, they can get paid 
quarter million, you know, half million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of shit that they have to put up with, though. A lot of shit that yes. an entrepreneur doesn't have to put up with because he can, you know, if he's got the right kind of business, he can tell certain people to go F themselves, right? So, yeah, exactly. So you, you know, would suggest to better, better putting your time before uh, starting doing going up. I think it's a better use of your time thing. to build it yourself. Okay. Like I would, I would person like today. I run a company of one. Okay, like it's it's okay. basically me. I have two contractors that that perform certain tasks that I contract out that I'm either not good at or I don't like doing, and that's it. I don't have any employees on payroll. I don't have any labor board issues. People don't call in sick. They're not fucking each other. I don't have uh, HR, you know, ish, like none of that stuff. It's it's yeah, very okay. agile. I can run this from anywhere in the world. Um, profit margin strong. I've run businesses with employees. I've worked in corporations and I've seen people climb the corporate ladder. You can do all those things, but honestly, I like small, nimble, and agile. I would I would rather run a company of one, which is what I do. I'm much happier this way. What is the goal? Like, why is it that this is appealing to you? Is you know the next so, thing that I'd so want to ask kind of you. Stuck. Right now, I'm one of my jobs is in a corporate business of education, right? So I'm I'm the dean of a college. Mm -hmm. So, but above me, there are a lot of people in the administrative ladder still. In, mm -hmm. Until I get to a, a like a CEO, CFO, or a big meaningful part within the administrative part of the school, so uh, I'm kind of stuck in the middle. So I'm and I'm starting other businesses that are starting to be a little bit more profitable for me. So in order in order for it to stay along with all the other businesses that are growing, uh, I would need to go up the corporate ladder. And what I found out is that. Uh, a lot of the positions that are above me require a lot of investment and maybe the return on investment is going, not going to be as much. And every time you, like you said, you have to put up with more crap as you mm. go up and mm. not necessarily is equivalent to what you're making in money. Yeah. Like, you know, the juice is not worth the squeeze, right? I mean, you know, you got to mm. ask yourself is climbing that position to the next job, the next role, the next level of res responsibility is the payoff going to be worth it. Most people find out that it's not, you know, by the time they get there, they just like, I've done all that stuff, right? Like I've, uh, I've, I've run my own business with a number of employees. I've worked in the corporate world and I've worked as a company of one. And this, to me, this is the best way to do it. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't care like, about the opinions yeah. of losers and haters. I can do whatever I want. I can, I can stop working for months, even fucking years. And it doesn't matter to me, right? Like I have full flexibility, autonomy, anti-fragility to me. That's the best place for a man to work himself into not, you know, if I get the next level up, then I get like level five on the pay raise and an extra week's vacation and these extra benefits. And it's like, okay, well, what other shit comes along with that? That's going to weigh me down and shorten my life by 10 years from all the stress with all the other crap that comes along with those responsibilities. So you got to weigh it out that way. I mean, I'm not saying that that's the way that it's going to go for you. It may not go that way. It could be lovely. It could be the most pleasant thing in the world. It, 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 it could be way better than what it is today, but you're already shaking your head because you're like, yeah, it doesn't sound like it is, it, right? It, yeah. Yeah. What happens is uh, all my other businesses are starting to grow farther than this business is going. So sooner or later, I have to decide whether to drop this one and then put that time into the other businesses that are giving me more that I'm starting to be more uh, my own boss. So, so, I, I wouldn't so it sounds like to me like is it's a is it's a conflict in your head between the risk and the safety. The safety of, of the exactly. dean of the school, the pension, the vacation, the medical benefits. You get all of that with that package versus the un you know the unknown yeah. Right. Well, it's not really the unknown yet, but because it's growing. So what it's I'm more unknown will... than the surety of of that of yeah, that tier with it all is. the shit it that is. comes with it. Lean into that. Lean into the unknown, because that's because you know people don't understand this, and I want you guys to really listen. I'm looking at the wrong camera because I got two. People don't understand this, but I want you to listen to this very very carefully. The the level like your soul could potentially be crushed and destroyed moving up to that next level doing all those things mm -hmm. to achieve that extra level of security and pension whereas 
there's a, a slight unknown over here that probably has way more upside with, with pay, happiness, flexibility, control. Yeah, you have more risk exposure. Yeah, there's more, there's like different kinds of BS that you have to put up with, but at least it's your BS. At least, you know, you can get like, one of the things that I hated about the corporate world, I'll tell you this story. I got in this fight with my boss one time. So you're reading my book and I talked, you know, I talked about in the book about um, hire slowly and fire quickly, you know, that fire lesson. Fire. If you guys haven't got the book, make sure you get it. But yeah. um, around that same time, this guy pissed me off. Like I was, I, I was just fed up with everything that was going on. I was fed up with the way that the business meetings were going. I was fed up with the way that he would talk to people. I was fed up with the way that he would talk to me. And I just didn't go into work one day, which was totally unlike me. I was the guy that showed up early. I was the guy that stayed late. I would go in on the fucking weekend. I would work my ass off because that that's just how I run my life, right? Like I work all the time still, you know, to this day. Like I'm working on Sundays. I'm working on the weekend. I just do it because I, you know, because I enjoy it. That's just who I am. And it got to the point where it's like, fuck it. I'm not going to work. And he called me up at 930 and he was like, where are you? Why aren't you here? I was like, you know what? I'm just going to make some steak and eggs. And have some fucking breakfast. I just don't feel like coming in today. What, are you going to come in on Monday? I don't know. I'll figure it out on Monday. And I hung up on it. That's that's the point that I got to. I've never gotten to that point working for myself. I've never hated myself, you know, working for myself. And if it if it got anywhere close to that, I would just change it because I have full control over it. So this is a question of security, pension, yeah. benefits, vacation versus some of the unknown over here and i've done both i would encourage you my brother go and lean into the unknown a little bit more i mean i'm not saying throw away the security you know no it's but not there. Sure the other one but yeah. yeah make sure you have an obvious amount of traction with that unknown so that it's more known than than unknown because when because when that unknown when that darkness becomes more known to you you're not even going to think about whatever opportunity at the dean of the whatever, you know, exists for you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your words and thank you. I, I, you kind of pushed me the way that I was thinking that I was going to go, but I, it's it's more comfortable to to hear someone else say that it's it's greener on the other side like you think. Good, man. Thank you very good. much, Rich. It's good to see you. Take care. Peace. Oh man, uh, I'm going to start to wrap it up. That guy's a great guy. If you don't know the story, he's you know he's been on uh, a couple times. He's he's told it before, so it's public. But he was a um, a veterinarian and went through a shitty divorce, uh, and uh, he was thinking about offing himself, taking a permanent solution to a temporary problem. He saw one of my videos, I think, on a computer screen, and he had a syringe loaded up with a horse tranquilizer, ready to you know jam in the thigh and shut everything all down and. Uh, here he is today. So, um, just goes to show you guys, you know, like even, like even your worst day there, there are people out there today right now that would trade their lives for your worst day. I guarantee you shit ain't as bad as you think it is. There's, there's, you know, you're in a hole, dig yourself out of it. Sometimes you got to dig down to come out the other side. Sometimes you just got to find another way out of it. But to the point of tonight's cast on the notion of envy, be very careful of these envious people on the inside specifically. They will envy first, they will befriend you, and they can try to destroy you. They will do things that will be problematic for you. On the outside, let the haters hate. Who cares? Just ignore these losers. Hate always comes from beneath. Don't worry about it. People on the inside, your inner circle, like the five people you spend the most time with, watch, watch those people. You know, your top staff that may work for you family members, even, even women in your life, you know, you have, you have to keep an eye out for this. One of the, one of the key things that I pointed out in my book in the 20 red flag chapter. Um, and by the way, you can get the 20 red flag chapter for free. Let me grab the banner because it is, where is it? Did I put it in here? There it is. I'll put it on the ticker. So get on my email list to get the 20 red flag uh, chapter, but one of the ones that I put in there specifically was around uh, women competing with you. And that's an envious trait, okay? Uh, if you get into a relationship with a chick that's constantly trying to compete with you, like, oh, look, my house is bigger than your house, or I have 10-foot ceilings, you only have 9-foot ceilings, or whatever, um, 
women that compete with you can't respect you. You will, you will always, the clock is ticking down to the end of that relationship at some point. Um, it, it just doesn't work out. A woman has to envy you, but she has to respect you more importantly. The respect comes well ahead of that envy. But if her envy is greater, meaning she tries to compete with you, watch out, be careful. All right. On that note, I'm going to wrap up in just a moment. Got a shout out to my channel sponsor. Uh, just over, let me put this thing down here. Just over my shoulder here, uh, Grandike Soap, Tactical Soap. Uh, they have a beard oil, pheromone sticks. Uh, you guys are showering anyway. So rather than using some bull crap that's got endocrine disruptors in it and uh, phthalates and all kinds of things, like read uh, Dr. Anthony J's uh, book. I did a cast with him on Playing to Win on his book, Estrogen Generation. So you can get some insight on it. But this stuff is clean. Anyway, check it out. It's it's also pheromone infused as well. Link is uh, below, pinned in the top description. Go to coopersoap.com. Check out with coupon code Cooper. Get 10% off. And uh, Scott's been a great guy. He's been a big supporter of the channel for a couple of years now. Appreciate him. Appreciate you guys for watching. We'll be back next Monday. After next Monday's show for channel members on the Q&A tier, so tier, tier two and higher, I'll drop the link, the, uh, link for the... Um, private zoom chat so if you guys have other questions or private questions you want to ask um but i think on that note we're going to wrap her up and uh we'll see you guys in the next show i got a lot of good videos coming out this week uh by the way and again if you haven't got the audiobook it's available i uh, read it myself it's uh, on audible right now if you don't have a membership check your email if you're on my email list because i sent the link to get your audible membership uh for free the you know the first credit's free anyway see you guys in the next show peace out